uh, Aaron Holiday is out of the is out of town uh, in in Hawaii right now. So uh, we uh, uh, he had to get a substitute, and I'm the one he asked. So uh, if you'll turn in your Bibles, please, to first to Second Kings, the twenty second chapter. 2 Kings 22. We'll get there in just a few minutes. The turn of the 7th century was a very crucial time in the history of Judah. Uh, King Hezekiah, who is good, had died. As you recall, he had uh, been told 15 years before that he was going to, to die. The prophet told him to get his house in order for he would die and not live. And he prayed to the Lord earnestly. And the Lord, before Isaiah had left the palace, that uh, the Lord told him that he would change his mind and give him 15 more years of life and told him what to do to be able to heal the, the wound that he had. That was sounds great. And it was something that Hezekiah appreciated and approved. But there were two things that happened in uh, that intervening 15-year period that are crucial to what would happen later on. One is, during the days of uh, Merodach Baladan, the king of Babylon, he visited. He apparently was uh, had just asserted his independence from the Assyrians, and uh, he came to visit Judah, and Hezekiah showed him all that was in his house. And that was something that probably for the future would be devastating because the Babylonians would eventually come and destroy the city of Jerusalem and take away all the things that were in the house of the king and in the, temp and in the te temple that the Lord had, had Solomon build. Uh, the second thing was, is during that 15-year period of time, he has a son named Manasseh who finally in in the year 697, when uh, Hezekiah dies, Manasseh, at the age of 12, becomes king. And Manasseh was the worst king that ever lived in Judah. In fact, when uh, the rabbis of the Middle Ages were asked, who was the most wicked man in the, in the Old Testament? You know, who might you suggest? You might suggest, you know, Ahab or someone like that. They always uniformly said Manasseh. And the reason they said Manasseh was because, for example, in verse 16 of chapter 21 in 2 Kings, it says, Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood until he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Beside his sin, which he made Judah sin, in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. I don't know how you would classify evil of who's bad and who's worse, but I think the rabbis were onto something because they noticed that not only did he do wrong himself, but because of wrong he made other people. And that's something that we ought to consider, that it's terrible to do wrong ourselves. But when we make other people do wrong, or we influence other people to do wrong, we've done something that makes us double culpable. And we need to understand and appreciate the terrible nature of that, that sort of thing. Uh, Manasseh was also uh, blessed or cursed, depending on how you want to look at it, to have reigned for 55 years. And therefore, the wickedness that he had in which he made his children pass through the fire, he, he erected all kinds of uh, idols, uh, worshipped Baal, worshipped uh, all the gods of heaven, put those things in the temple of Jehovah. In fact, it's said he shed much innocent blood. The tradition among the Jews was that he had Isaiah sawn in two. We don't read about that in the Word of God. But do you remember in, in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, it talks about things that people had suffered for the cause of Christ, for the cause of the Lord, and it said they were sawn in two? That may very well be what they're talking about because it just so happens that Isaiah's 
uh, demise corresponds with the beginning years of Manasseh's reign. After 55 years, Manasseh dies. And the sad thing about it, too, was that Manasseh, according to 2 Chronicles, had corrected what was wrong to the best of his ability in the later part of his life. You remember the Lord, as it tells us in 2 Chronicles 33, he had allowed the king of Assyria to come and take Manasseh Draw him away with hooks, as it says, because the Assyrians had a, had a uh, habit of running piercings through people's noses and hooks and roping them together by the nose. Can you imagine how easy that would be to go wherever somebody else wanted you to go? In some cultures, they put rings in bulls' noses because bulls are hard to control, but when you have that bull's nose, he'll go anywhere that nose goes. And Manasseh went anywhere the nose went to. But he repents and turns away from his evil. And the Lord restores him to his position. And he tries for the rest of his days to correct whatever he had done that was wrong. But the sad thing about it was he had done wrong. He caused other people to do wrong. And while he repented, he was not able to achieve that same result in the ones that he had caused to sin. He succeeded by his son Ammon. And Ammon only reigns two years, but it tells us that he walked in the same ways as Manasseh, his father, had walked. And we see him finally at the end of two years being assassinated by his, his counselors and overthrown. And it tells us that his son, Josiah, was placed on the throne. Would somebody read 2 Kings 22, verses 1 through 7 for us, please? Can I have a reader? Yes, there's a hand up there. Is that Steve? Yes. Please read that for us. You're a good reader. 2 Kings 22, verses 1 through 7. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedida, the daughter of Adiah of uh, Boseth. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And it came to pass in the eighteenth year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. And let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the doors, doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord, to repair the, bre the uh, breaches of the house, unto carpenters and builders and masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand, because they dealt faithfully. Here is someone that shows us the very important principle in Scripture that just because you've had wicked ancestors doesn't mean that you have to do wicked yourself. Here was someone who overcame the wickedness of his grandfather and overcame the wickedness of his father. And you're right, his grandfather had repented, but his repentance was so late and apparently so insignificant in the uh, history of Judah that it's not even recorded in 2 Kings' account that he had repented because the nation hadn't repented. But Josiah, his great-grandson, and, and his grandson, and Ammon, his father, were wicked, but Josiah was not, even from the age of eight. And when he was about 16, he began, he turned to the Lord, and when he was about 26, it tells us that he began to repair the temple because he had seen how terrible it had been defiled by his grandfather and his father, and he wound up doing everything that he could, spending money that had been gathered for that to be able to repair the breaches in the temple. 
to be able to fix those things that were wrong, to destroy those items that were idolatrous in the temple, and to make it again once a, once available for uh, the worship of Jehovah. It tells us, though, that in the process of, of going through the temple, there's something very important that's found. Uh, would someone read for us verse 8 through, through 13? Can I have another reader, please? Yes, uh, Scott. And Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and uh, Ahikam the uh, son of Shaphan and Echbor the son of Micaiah and Shaphan the secretary and Isaiah the king's servant saying, Go inquire the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the wor words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. They find this book in the temple. And apparently it's a book that people aren't familiar with. Of all things, can you imagine the people of God cleaning out the temple that was made for the Lord's worship, and they find this book. And it's read, and then it's read before the king, and the king tears his garments because he realizes it's the book of the law. It's not only what we've neglected, but it includes the curses upon those who don't do what the law told them to do. Now, some people believe that this was the entire Torah, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy. There are others that believe it may have just been the book of Deuteronomy that was given here, because it's the one that contains the blessings and the curses of the law, and how terrible it would be to turn against the Lord. It also, in the book of Deuteronomy, you remember that they were told that when they had a king, the king was to write down all the words of the law and to have it read before him all the days of his reign. And Josiah knows that hasn't been done. So he tears his clothes and worries that these are things that are obviously going to come upon us because we've done all these terrible things that bring about all the curses that God has prophesied. So, he inquires of the Lord. And they go to a priest, a prophetess whose name is Huldah. Would somebody read for us verses 14 through 20 of chapter 22? Can I get another reader? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Jeremy, thank you. Okay. 14 through 22, is that what you said? Chapter 22 through 20. Uh, through chapter 22, 13, 14. I'll 14 get it right through in a 20. 14 through 20. Okay. So Hilkiah the priest and Hygim and Egbor and Shaphan and Azahiah went to hold the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they talked with her. And she said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants, all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus, says, thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that have, you have read, because your heart was penitent, and you humbled yourself before the Lord, 
when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place. And they brought back word to the king. Hold of the prophetess is consulted, and she gives a message to this righteous king that is a discouraging message. What does she say, basically? Excuse me? It's going to happen. It's too late. There's been too much wickedness. Go on for too long. And even in the reforms of Hezekiah, even in the reforms of Manasseh, it's too, too, too late. And the people's hearts have been so turned away from God that God is going to bring upon them the curses that had been promised. Now, someone, when they are told that it's too late, might very well be to the point where they uh, become so discouraged they don't do anything. You know, uh, that, that's easy to understand. You know, how that somebody might just throw their hands up and say, well, it's time to wait. You know, uh, Habakkuk, you remember he calls out to the Lord uh, here a little bit later and says, uh, Lord, look how wicked things are in, in the land. Uh, how can you put up with this? And he says, well, listen, there's something going on right now that you wouldn't believe if I told you. But I'm going to tell you that I'm raising up the Babylonians to come and destroy Judah. And he says, Lord, are you sure that's what you want to do? They're worse than we are. But he says, just wait. Just wait and see, because even though this is going to happen to the nation, the just shall live by faith. And Habakkuk realizes what he's going to have to do is wait on the Lord. Could have been easy for Josiah to fold his hands and say, I'm just going to wait on the Lord. But he says, you know, perhaps I can do something that would make the Lord change his mind. At least I will have done the right thing in standing before God. And it's with such a heart that the Lord makes the promise to Huldah to give to Josiah to let him understand that these are things that are going to happen, but I'm not going to let you see the wicked that will happen in your day. I'll let you come to your grave in peace. Now, he's going to die in battle. So he's not talking about coming in peace that way, but he's going to come in peace because he's not going to see the slaughter of his children. He's not going to see the slaughter of his grandchildren. He's not going to see the burning of the tabernacle, of the temple. He's not going to see the destruction of the walls of Jerusalem. He's not going to see the people under siege to the extent that they cannibalized themselves. So therefore, he comes to his grave in peace. Notice what he does in chapter 23. It tells us that uh, in verse 1 of chapter 23, the king sent and they gathered to him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem and the king went up to the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great, and read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. Can you imagine us standing in a situation to where the king calls upon us and says, everybody gather together today. We're going to stand here and we're going to listen while all the law is read in your hearing, both small and great. Bring your kids. Bring your grandma. Everybody is going to hear this law. Scott. I just wanted to say, even though Josiah is hoping he can still turn the people mm -hmm. and going to try to turn the people, and he, you know, and, but God has the same attitude. When we studied Ezekiel, even up to the end, God told me, how many times did I send you a prophet if you would just repent? It wouldn't, uh, this would be, you know, it wouldn't happen. And not just in Ezekiel, it's in other prophets too. 
And so just because God had declared it's too late and this is what's going to happen doesn't mean that that took away free will from the people. Right. He, 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 they could have easily repented and God would have said, okay, right. I take you back and it'll maybe be for a future date or another time or whatever. Right. Um, so, so God hadn't, I mean, he never gave up either. He kept trying. So yeah. Josiah is going to try. God continues to try. It's just unfortunate that the hearts of the people just aren't uh, melted by yeah. the word of God. That's right. Excellent point. Excellent point. Did I see another hand up? All the people have the law read to them. And it says the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to carry out the words of the covenant that were written in the book. And all the people entered into the covenant. Here's the situation in which he, said he is doing everything he can to bring the people back around to what's right. They're going to not, not say that I, that I went to my grave not knowing what the law was because it's been read in the hearing of everybody. You're not going to go to your grave saying, we didn't know anything about a covenant with God, but do you remember the covenant that God had made with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob? Do you remember the covenant that he had made with the sons of Jacob? Do you remember the covenant that had been made in the days of Moses? You remember the time the covenant was renewed in the, in the book of Deuteronomy in the days of Moses to the second generation? You remember the covenant that had, been, that had been done by David and by Solomon all through the days of the kings, and yet here we find it having to be renewed in the days of this good king, this good young king, just in his 20s, Josiah. He began to engage in all kinds of reforms. It tells us in verse 4 of chapter 23 that the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and his doorkeepers and brought out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal, for Ashira, and all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kedron and carried their ashes to Bethel. Here, the Kedron Valley is that valley that is to the west of the city of Jerusalem. And he takes everything from the, from the hills of the city of David and the Mount Moriah and pushes all of that over in the Kedron Valley uh, because it's to be destroyed and to be burned. He took away the idols, and you notice he carried them to Bethel. What's that Bethel? That's where the calf was. And here he's doing these things to take them and destroy them and defile the image and the altar that was at Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had appointed to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the surrounding area of Jerusalem. Also those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the constellations and to the hosts of heaven. And he brought out the Asherah from the house of the Lord outside Jerusalem to the brook Kedron. And he burned it at the brook Kedron and ground it to dust and threw its dust on the graves of the common people. Even pagan people believed that if you took something and you, you defiled it by putting it in contact with dead men's bones. And here he's taking the Baal idols. He's taking the Asherah poles which were uh, symbols of a female deity that the, that the Canaanites worshipped, that were basically poles that it implied uh, some sort of phallic worship. And here they were taken and destroyed and burned and pushed over into the Kedron Valley. He broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes, which were in the house of the Lord. Can you imagine people so wicked that they would have the, the stalls of male prostitutes in the house of Jehovah, he took those out. And where the women were weaving hangings for the Asherah, and they brought all the priests from the cities of Judah that defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense, 
from Geba, which is the northern part of Judah, to Beersheba, which is in the south part of Judah. And he broke down the high places of the gates that were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on one's left at the city gate. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places did not go up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brothers. He also defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire of Molech. The valley of Hinnom was to the south of Jerusalem, south of the city of David portion of Jerusalem. And there is a word in the New Testament that comes from this here. It is the word Gehenna that comes from this valley of the sons of Hinnom. It is also called Topheth in the scriptures. Do you know anything that happened there besides what he describes here? What is Gehenna? It's a name for hell in scripture. It became, by the time of the New Testament, probably the city dump. It was even a place that was so defiled that somebody who was a stranger in town, who didn't have a place for burial when they died, their bodies in a shameful fashion were taken and burned in Topheth. But here he took it and he defiled it so it wouldn't be able to be used to slaughter the infants that were born and sacrifice to Baal. He did away with the horses which the kings of Judah had given to the sun. At the entrance of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the official who was in the precincts, and burned the chariots of the sun with fire. And the altars that were on the roof, the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made, and the two courts of the house of the Lord, the king broke down and he smashed them there and threw their dust into the brook Kidron. And the high places which were before Jerusalem, which were on the right of the Mount of Destruction, which Solomon the king of Israel had built for Eshtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, and for Chemosh the abomination of Moab, and for Milcom the abomination of the sons of Ammon the king defiled. And he broke in pieces the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherim and filled their places with human bones. Do you get the idea that Josiah is trying to do this right? That he's trying to undo century, a century of wrong to the very best of his ability. In fact, he even went further. In verse 15, it says, Furthermore, the altar that was at Bethel. Remember what was at Bethel we said a while ago? That's where Jeroboam in 1 Kings 13, had built an altar to the golden calf that was to be worshipped. There was one at Dan and one at Bethel. And the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, had made, even that altar and the high place he broke down, then he demolished its stones, ground them to dust, and burned the Asherah. And when Josiah turned, he saw the graves that were on the mountain, and he sent and took the bones from the graves and burned them in the altar and defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God... I'll get it in a minute. ...had proclaimed, who proclaimed these things. You remember in 1 Kings 13, we're told about a man who in the in initiation of the altar there at the golden calf at Bethel. You had an unnamed prophet who comes there and really rains on Jeroboam the first parade by telling him, altar, altar, altar. There's going to be a king named Josiah from the house of David who's going to come and he's going to destroy this altar and he's going to defile it with the bones of you priests who are offering sacrifices on it. 1 Kings 13, 1 and 2. Here it tells us that's exactly what Josiah did some 265 years later. And isn't it interesting 
that the Lord in the Word of God calls him by name 265 years before he was born. But he looks and sees a monument there. And the men of the city told him it's the grave of the man of God who came from Judah and proclaimed these things which you have done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, let them alone. Let no one disturb his bones. So they left his bones undisturbed with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. Josiah also removed all the houses of the high places which were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made, provoking the Lord. And he did to them just as he had done to Bethel. And all the priests of the high places who were there, he slaughtered by the altars and burned human bones on them. Then he returned to Jerusalem. He does the best he can do in Judah, but that's not enough. He goes up into what had been the northern kingdom, and he destroys that altar at Bethel. And it tells us in the Second Chronicles account, in chapter 34 and 35, that he went up to the north, into the area of Manasseh, into the area of Ephraim, into the area of Simeon, even as far as Naphtali. And at the far end of Naphtali was a place called Dan where there was a second town. And he went and he destroyed all of those and he slaughtered those priests who were worshiping them. See, this guy tries to be thorough, doesn't he? How much, how much evil do you think he wants to tolerate in his reign? None. How much, uh, let's suppose you've got a dog that at your party gets up on the table and urinates in the punch bowl. How much punch do you want to drink? You know, I'd say, well, he listened, he didn't pee much in the bowl. No, you throw it all out because you don't want anything that's wrong in what's right. And here we see that's the best that Judah does. That's the best he could do. He even institutes a Passover. Now, we remember in the days of Hezekiah, there was a Passover that was reinstituted that apparently had been neglected for a long time. But it tells us in verse 21 of chapter 23, the king commanded all the people, saying, Celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God, as it's written in this book of the covenant. Surely such a Passover had not been celebrated from the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel to the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was observed in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Now remember, Hezekiah had reinstituted the Passover. But I think the key is there had not been such a Passover celebrated. What was the problem that we talked about last week with Hezekiah's Passover observance? Yeah, he did it in the second month. There were other priests that had done it. There were priests that were not, had not, uh, that had defiled themselves, who were not Levitical. There were others who had done things that uh, even the Levitical priests had done so without being ceremonially clean. So Hezekiah made a good faith effort. And you remember when the people were unclean, he prayed for them, and the Lord cleaned them, cleansed them. Josiah apparently didn't go through those errors. They went through the covenant, and they did it, and they did it right. It also tells us that he removed the mediums and the spiritists from the land, people who were being gone to by the people of the land to be, find out what they needed to do to be able to coordinate their lives day by day by the sun and the moon, and the stars, and the dead, and all of those things kind of things, and he got rid of them in the land. And all the abominations that, that were seen in the land of Judah and Jerusalem, that he might confirm the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. 
And it tells us in verse 25, Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. Hezekiah had been a great king. Hezekiah is one that it says there had been no one who had turned to the Lord, uh, no one who had put their faith in the Lord like Hezekiah. But there was no one who repented like Josiah. And that was one of the things that was important about him. But in verse 26, it tells us, But the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great anger, which he had burned against Judah because of all the provocations, which, what does it say? Manasseh had provoked. Here's the guy's grandpa. But he had done so much wrong. He had turned the people so far away. But in all the efforts that Josiah made, they couldn't be brought back to the point where God wanted them to be. So the Lord said, I'll remove Judah from my sight as I have removed Israel, and I will cast off Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen, the temple which I have said my name shall be there. So it tells us the rest of the acts of Josiah. And all that he did are not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah, and you can find them there too. In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. And King Josiah went out to meet, and when Pharaoh Necho saw him, he killed him at Megiddo. And his servants drove his body in a chariot from Megiddo and buried him in his own tomb. Then the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in place of his father. He's not quite 40 years old yet. He dies at the age of 39 in battle against Pharaoh Necho. Necho II is who, it's being, who is being discussed here. He had just become king in, in Egypt, ruled from the city of Sais in the Delta, and he decided that what he wanted to do as he was familiar with the geopolitics of the time, he was concerned about Babylon. Babylon had risen up against the Assyrians, and the Assyrian Empire was being destroyed. In 612, the city of Nineveh fell. But the Assyrian Empire wasn't finished. It had retreated to the west. And we see the Babylonians moving to the west to destroy Assyria. And Pharaoh Necho moving to the north to intercept them so that he might be able to aid what's left of the Assyrian Empire and fight against the Babylonians. In the meantime, Necho thinks that he'll be able to restore the ancient Egyptian Empire that included much of Canaan all the way to Syria. And he goes up and on his way to fight in the Battle of Kadesh, which he wins on the Orontes River, Josiah comes out to meet him. And at the Battle of Megiddo, uh, Josiah is defeated, is killed in his chariot, and it tells us in the Chronicles account that he's able to go all the way to Megiddo, the city, and he, he dies there in the city. And it tells us here in the Second Kings account that he's buried. Uh, Nico was a man who uh, was uh, a powerful king. He, uh, on his way back from uh, his victory there in 609 at Kadesh, he winds up coming through Judah, and they had appointed Jehoahaz, the son of, uh, the, a younger son, oddly enough, of Josiah, to be king in his place in Judah. Necho doesn't like that, so he deposes Jehoahaz and puts his brother Jehoiakim in on the throne, and Jehoiakim will reign for 11 years. On his second military campaign, Necho goes up and fights against the, the Babylonians with what's left of Assyria and is defeated at the Battle of Carchemish. It takes place in about 605 B.C. And he retreats, and the Egyptians are not as powerful again as they would be during that particular time. The reign of 
Josiah ends in 609 when he dies. And he's followed by three of his sons and one of his grandsons. Jehoahaz reigned for three months. Jehoiakim reigns for 11 years. He's succeeded by his son, Jehoiakim, who reigns for three years. And then Jehoiakim's uncle, Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, was uh, appointed king to reign for the last 11 years of the history of Judah. But as it told us, sadly, there's a little bit of a note that comes very, very subtly at the end of verse 25 in chapter 23 in 2 Kings. It says, There was none like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after. He has three sons and one grandson that rule after him, all of which were evil. What does it tell us about Josiah when we see a man who is succeeded by a wicked father and a wicked grandfather and wicked sons and wicked grandsons? What does it tell us about our responsibilities and our possibilities in our time? Anyone? We have to clean up the messes that we create. Sometimes we have to clean up the messes that other people create. And uh, that's true. Yes. Uh, I can't see who it is, but... It's Jim. Jim. Hey, Jim. <clears throat> you know, um, as you were talking about the terrible things that, that occur, I, I think of Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Mm -hmm. it, it's really two verses that encapsulate what is good, and it's familiar to all oh. of us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And this is one of my favorite lines in the entire Bible. Against such, there is no law. Right. So that encompasses good, right? We understand what good is. But then I think about how evil seems to have no limits. Right. In other words, the, as, as far as the imagination can take evil, it takes it. You've described that with some of the things that have happened. So maybe we shouldn't be surprised when we see what happens or what is happening uh, in our nation. And so I don't have an answer to your question. I was hoping to ask that question to you because I would love to hear how you think we could make application in the 21st century. Well, I appreciate your point. Uh, we all stand before God on our own. Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither the Father the iniquity of the Son, but the soul that sins will die. You may come from a good heritage, of, and I think you ought to appreciate it if you had parents and grandparents that loved the Lord, but you don't get any credit for that. You have to do the things that are right. You know, if you have a bad background, if you come from a background of people who didn't love the Lord and didn't serve Him, you can still do the right thing. Oh? I was going to say, um, to answer your question, I think the short answer is you have to make your faith your own. Yes, sir. Um, so just because your parents are faithful doesn't mean you're going to be faithful, or just because your parents had a bunch of issues uh, doesn't mean that you have to follow suit. Um, so it's deciding for yourself who you want to be. So. Excellent point. Thank you. Our time's up. Oh, I'm sorry. Is another hand up? Yeah. I'm sorry. Is that Esther? Yes. Okay. So um, it, this all goes back to Joshua 24, 15, when he says, choose this day whom you will serve. Bingo. You know, will you follow your ancestors or the Amorites, or are you going to choose God? Right. So. right. That is a, that's, a, that's a good passage, isn't it? Uh, thank you for your attention tonight and your patience. Uh, I think, uh, I don't think Aaron's going to be back next.